The 49ers are clearly a better team, but they're in the same division. Maybe they can build something, and they got some more winnable games coming up, and maybe they can go to 6-2 and two or something like that. And then you look at Seattle yeah. for a second straight season. You go, you know what? They, they're giving you what they got. I mean, Pete Carroll is obviously one hell of a coach because when he has Hall of Fame talent, he produces up here. And when he has less than that, he seems to get them ready. So the Giants sort of bore me. They're overstated and often overrated. I'm presuming you'll take the team on I-95. Yeah, well, I mean, I'll, I'll say this. I admire what Seattle is doing. Yeah. I admire the fact that they traded Russell Wilson, who was in two Super Bowls for them, and they have a reclamation project in Geno Smith, and he becomes comeback player of the year, and they make the playoffs, and he's got five touchdowns this year and one interceptions. But I'll dwell a little bit on the Giants because the Giants stink, and so do the Jets. The two teams that are the tenants in the Meadowlands are awful. They're two and six. And, Mike, this is an amazing statistic. Neither the Giants nor the Jets have run a single offensive play when they were ahead in a game this year. Not one. Not one. The Giants are like minus 76 or something like that. But if you take away that great second half they had on the the comeback against Arizona, they have been outscored 114 to 15. They got two beatdowns to their record already. Yes, two Minus 99, Mike. They, Daniel Jones will tuck the ball and he'll run, but he doesn't get you in the end zone. No. They do not get in the end zone. That can't just be Saquon Barkley. It can't be. No. It can't be. Sorry. Giants. Maybe I would love it to go weeks without having to talk about the Giants. Let's move to the baseball playoffs. The AL wildcard series started this afternoon, and tonight we get the National League matchups featuring the Diamondbacks and Brewers and the Marlins at Phillies. So on which teams do you favor in these two best of three series? Well, I think you have to favor the Phillies. I mean, the Phillies have a terrific, powerful, everyday lineup. In the last two months of the season, Mike, they had 105 homers, which was the same as Atlanta, which has more homers than anybody. They got five guys who have 20 or more homers, and that's just one below Atlanta. I mean, I know that the Marlins have won that season series 7-6, to six, but if you look at the Marlins, their, their run differential is actually minus 57. So all of those fan graph stats or whatever that is says that their record should be 74 and 88. And their record is, instead of that, 84 and 77. Are they lucky? I don't know. They've won 33 games by one run. I don't that's think that's luck. Games, but yeah. I, also, I also think that's reversible, as you're going to see with the Minnesota Vikings from last year to this year, winning all those things by one touchdown. And in the other series, I mean, I like Milwaukee because they won eight more games than the other squad, than, than Arizona. But the best player in that series is Corbin Carroll. He's the only player ever, Mike, ever. It's an arcane stat, but it's ever to have at least 50 steals, at least 25 home runs, and at least 10 triples. That, he's a rookie. Come on. That's pretty good. Tony, but the most important person tonight is Corbin Burns in that series. I don't care about the... Phillies and Marlins. I don't. The, Philly, the Marlins won a bunch of one-run games. You can do it. It's this year. It's not next year yet. The Cubs lost probably 33 one-run games in there at, at the crib watching. So, But I'm going to go to the Diamondbacks, Tony, who are starting some rookie who has pitched well in the last couple of outings against Milwaukee in Milwaukee and Corbin Burns, yeah. whose record in ERA are not sparkling, but his 1.07 whip is fifth in the league, and that is closer to sparkling. That's a huge advantage when you're going to play all the games at home. You're going in your opener on your home turf with your best pitcher against, or at least your second best pitcher. Your best pitcher is actually injured, not going to play in this series, may not be able to play in the postseason. But you got Corbin Burns out there going against a rookie, win the game, get one up in the best of three. I will just say this, that that honestly, I'm really waiting for the Dodgers and the Braves in the National League. Yeah, we'll get to uh, it. You know, late in the week. They're the class. Real late. They are the class of the National We move now to golf, where Xander Shoffley's father has been publicly vocal that his son almost lost his spot in the Ryder Cup because of his objection to the fact that Ryder Cup players have no say in the way Ryder Cup money gets distributed. The issue of money came up with Patrick Cantlay as well. Cantlay reportedly felt that players should get paid, though he denied that publicly. This is a complicated issue. Yeah. Wilbon, where are you on Shoffley and the dispute about Ryder Cup money? Tony, my answer is kind of complicated. Um, I understand why Shoffley's dad is involved and vocal about this. He's a dad. It's his son. You know, you and I have sons who played sports. Yours golf at a pretty high level. We, we, yep. we understand the emotion involved here. But, Tony, 
I think my overall response is more this. I'm not going to weep for you at the salaries and the money that is made. I, I get it. You may think you have a beef. They don't say what the amendments were. They didn't, they wouldn't agree to even talk about the amendments. I don't even know what the amendments are or were, Tony. So I'm not going to say they should not get paid. I'm not. I know people can right. say we're playing for country. There's still all kinds of rewards that may be under the table. There are endorsements. I'm not going to say they shouldn't get paid. But I'm not going to weep for them either. It's one of those things that is a complex issue, but I just can't bring myself to care to throw no. myself in front of the car to take either of these positions for either side. Uh, the impetus for Shoffley's father is that he's Shoffley's business manager. I thought the best thing about the Ryder Cup was Cantlay not wearing a hat, right? And, and the scuttlebutt, of course, was that that was his protest that right. the Ryder Cup guys did not get paid. He called it a lie. And he said... He said, yeah, he said the hat didn't fit. You can't tell me that the, the, the manufacturer with the contract for the USA couldn't have put 50 hats on a plate that would fit this guy. It's clear that that was a protest. Now, I didn't know, Mike, I, I didn't know that Ryder Cup guys didn't get paid. I didn't know it was just an honorific position. And my first reaction was, well, they ought to get paid because there's no Ryder Cup without the players. We talk about this with college athletes. They ought yeah. to get paid. So yeah. I, I didn't understand that. I but then I, I did a little homework. Yeah. I went to Columbia the other day, and I talked to the guys who work in the bag room and guys who are teaching pros, and they said all of this money funnels down to from the PGA of America to teaching pros. They don't make millions of dollars like touring pros. They make thousands and not that many thousands. This is what they depend on. So it, I changed my position, though I do think, Mike, to be fair, they ought to at least get a little NIL if they're going to be in the you Well, know, the Tony, there is NIL. Yeah, As we get something. into endorsement now, look, guys yeah. can get, well, you know, seriously, who doesn't want to attach themselves to say Colin Morikawa? You do. And there's, there's going to be I some benefit down the road. I don't feel road. badly. I don't, I don't yeah. feel badly for them. Right. But I think in fairness, they ought to get something. I wouldn't argue I do. Against Phil that. Mickelson was right. Yes. There's all this money. Let's take a it. break. Coming up, at what point should the Bengals consider playing a health six sacks against them, his old team? We're going to ask Jeff Saturday. And you're working in a bathroom. You're giving lessons. You're not making millions of dollars. And if this is the money that comes to you, that's good. Well, they also but see the executives flying in and, you know, G6s, and they well, get a little resentful That's that. not good. <laughs> Let's get back into the NFL with ESPN NFL analyst, six-time Pro Bowl center and the former head coach of the Colts, Jeff Saturday. Let us start with this. If you were part of the Giants' offensive line that just gave up 11 sacks, <laughs> oh, my God, 11 sacks last night, what would you be doing today with your fellows on the offensive line. Yeah, talking about techniques and fundamentals, right, Tony? Like, we, we got to settle this thing down. Not everything in the NFL is about scheme. And, and when you see a guy like Andrew Thomas, you're praying for him to get back as quickly as possible because the one thing you can usually guarantee for those good left tackles is go block the end and then we'll worry about the rest of them. But right now, on that left side, you're getting too much pressure, which opens up the rest of it. But techniques and fundamentals have really kind of gone to the wayside. And I think when you watch them last night, so many things that really moves that shouldn't be kind of finishing moves to get to the quarterback have become that where guys are getting edged and all of a sudden Daniel Jones feels that pressure he kind of panics it, it pushes him to rush his throws or pull the ball down and we saw him try to tuck it and run it for a strap uh, a strip sack um, but you got to go back to those things don't don't make a, a mountain out of a molehill understand if we follow our techniques and fundamentals we'll get this thing back in in, in order and we can protect our QB Jeff, we're going to stay with the offensive line for a second and look at the Bengals who got blown out. And Joe Burrow is, of course, struggling to get the ball downfield. Yeah. He's got that injured calf. From an offensive line perspective, at what point would you rather protect a healthy backup quarterback than even your star if he can't move mm. around and can't be himself? 
That's a great question. Almost never. Honestly, I'm just being real. You know, look, man, we, you know, he, he's a star for a reason. And, and, you know, you're just hoping that he has enough in that leg or in that calf to make some of those throws that he's made. And I think he brings a level of confidence to guys. Um, I understand that with, with the limitations he has, defenses can play you different because they're not afraid he's going to pull it down and run in the middle, which he has done a number of times in his career. But you're as an offensive line, and, and so when you're looking at a guy like Joe Burrow, you, you'd take a, an 80% Joe Burrow over any backup. So, but, but if he's, if it is, and this is the true question for me, uh, Mike, is, is how hurt is he? Like, is he because of the pressure that's getting to him? Because they haven't done a great job either. So it's kind of an if and and for me, but, but look, I, I want to block for that guy. Let's talk about Khalil Mack for a second in his six sacks. I know to an hey. offensive lineman, six sacks, you're yeah. offended hearing that. But Jeff, For real. was it a fluke? We know how great Khalil Mack is. But six sacks, I mean, I think the record is seven. What do you do to slow down a guy who is that talented and on a roll? Yeah, no, listen, I, I was surprised. And, and what ends up happening is you, you um, when things start going bad for offensive linemen, you kind of retreat to, to trying to backpedal and stay in front of guys, right? And so no, you lose your aggression of your set. And I, I tell people all the time, and, I, and, and I've said it when I coach guys, coach kids in high school, you know, when, when you get fearful, be more aggressive. Go jump set him. Go attack him and make him beat you right away. Because the problem is, as you shrink back, he sees it, and he feels it, and he gets more encouraged, right? And you see a guy like Khalil Mack who is built like a brick house anyhow, but when you see him getting, getting his pads down below you, getting some push on the quarterback, all he's doing is thriving on you retreating. And so I would tell all those guys, go back to being aggressive. Don't soft set. Don't drop set. Be aggressive at the line of scrimmage. Make sure you're putting your hands on him. Make it a longer way for him to beat you, even if he has to beat you once or twice. Make him beat you all the way back as opposed to moving yourself closer to the quarterback and giving him a shorter distance. That's kind of what happened uh, the other night. So we will get you out of here on this. It's the question you anticipated. It's the question that everybody wants to ask. Someone who was a head coach for eight or nine games, you left broadcasting last year to coach the Colts, your old team. What do you know now that you wish you had known then when you took the job? Oh, that's a great question. You know, uh, first of all, I love the experience. Very few people, that, it's never happened. So, you know, no one has had, it. it's an incredible experience. The, the ability to turn around or, or, or make big shifts in the middle of a season, I didn't realize it would be as much as it was, right? And so when you think about, you know, they had had nine, basically nine months from February of that year uh, until, until uh, November, they had put all kinds of things in. So when you go in to make change, you're trying to build relationships with a staff, with players, kind of all on the fly. And as you're playing these games, you basically get three days, right? It's like, bang, 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 we're playing again. Bang, 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 you're playing again. And so the amount of time to get things changed or to kind of tweak or put your stamp on it, for lack of a better term, um, those are the things, right? And I remember Tom Moore used to say this. He's, he's the great offensive coordinator, Hall of Famer, you know, all the way around. He was with the Steelers, with us at the Colts, and now with the Buccaneers. He's like, men, teams are built from March until August. And then what you are is what you are. And we're going to make the most we can of it. Uh, that is a true statement, much truer than I ever believed. But I had a great time. Made, I had some great relationships, not only with coaches that I still talk to and players that I still text with and talk with. Um, good people, man. We, we had an absolute blast. Wish we would have won more games. But again, no regrets from my end. Thanks, Jeff. Jeff this is that terrific. is great, man. Thanks very Thank much. You. Thank Just you. Terrific. Good to have you back. We appreciate it. Appreciate it, fellas. Let's take a break. Coming up, could James Harden actually oh. join the Sixers oh. after all? Why do you want Enough. James Harden? Get him Why? off the show. Get him off the show. And an enormous, enormous swing show. in the fortunes of an Australian tennis player. I mean, Harden, he's gonna, he just said he mm -hmm. called the president of basketball ops a liar. Hey, how are you going to go you play had, for him? Had, what if you had Jeff Saturday's opportunity and they wanted you to coach Northwestern? Would you do it? was the number two overall draft pick last April, beyond Bryce Young, who went number one to Carolina. At the moment, Stroud, who's 6'3", compared to Young's 5'10", he's winning that race. Stroud has the Texans 2-2 two and two after Sunday's surprising demolition of Pittsburgh. Stroud had two touchdown passes, 
306 yards of passing and no interceptions. For the season so far, Stroud has six touchdown passes and no picks. He's the first player ever with 1,200 plus yards passing and zero interceptions through his first four games. Stroud may be that rare quarterback to come out of Ohio State and succeed in the NFL. Oh, maybe taking a shot, huh, my man, Justin Fields. You know what? Fields could be that rare quarterback, too, if he gets adequate yep. coaching. God help us yeah. if he gets inventive coaching, because he ain't got either one of those right now, so he's fighting against that, too. Still went 23 for 24 on Sunday. Let's keep that in mind. Stroud looks It great. is remarkable Stroud that great. no Ohio State quarterback has been it, it, good. It's, it's remarkable. A hundred years. Happy anniversary, Miguel Cabrera. On this day 11 years ago, the Tiger Slugger became the first player in 45 years since Yaz to win the Triple Crown. Cabrera's lead leaguing numbers, 44 home runs, 139 RBI, batting average of 330, earning him the first of two consecutive MVP awards. Cabrera's last game was Sunday. He was 0 for 3 as a DH, but took the field in the eighth at first base. And on cue, he got a ground ball hit his way, fielded it cleanly for the unassisted putout. His kids and teammates then emerged from the dugout to literally usher him into retirement. Cabrera leaves baseball as one of only three players with 500 home runs, 3,000 hits, and a career batting average above 300. You may have heard of the other two, Willie Mays and Hank Aaron. So now, not only is he maybe the most underrated, underappreciated player of all time because of the franchises he played for. Didn't play New York, Boston, L.A., didn't do that. But also, Tony, he's so smart and funny. And we, we didn't, people don't know. He wasn't interviewed enough. There wasn't yeah. enough of him to consume. Well, I listened to an interview with him on Major League Baseball Network a couple of years ago, and I was like, my God, where is this guy? Why didn't we pay him more attention? That's our loss, not his. Happy trails to the Shanghai Masters Tournament for Mark Pullmans. The Australian tennis player had match point on his racket when he buried a volley into the net. Out of frustration, he tried to swat the ball off the court, but instead drilled chair umpire Ben Anderson in the face. Ooh. Holmans was immediately disqualified Ooh. from the match, and the ATP will decide on any further disciplinary action. Chair umpire treated with an ice pack on his nose and cheek and was reported to be okay when he left the stadium to rest at his hotel. This is reminiscent of Novak Djokovic being tossed out of the U.S. Open in 2020 after smacking a ball out of frustration that hit a lineswoman in the throat. Okay, Djokovic didn't hit that ball nearly as hard as what we saw go into that lineman's face and I, the chair umpire, and I'm glad it was that person as opposed to, you see the ball boy or girl, I couldn't even tell which one, that was nearby. I don't even want to think about that possibility, but God, people have to control themselves on, on the court at all times, even afterwards. You see, you see that very often, that in frustration, people try to pound the ball, yeah. sometimes into the net and sometimes into the stands, and it's coming off the racket at high speed. Yes, it is. And these linesmen are about 30 feet away. So it's a, it's a dangerous thing you need to consider when you go to pound it. We're running out of show, and we go to the big finish. Let's the boy, it. James Harden, is expected to rejoin oh, the Sixers no. as soon as tonight. No. What is that? Let me speak to my man, Daryl Morley. No, no, no. Even if you take back 75 cents on the dollar, no. He needs to go. Phil Nevin won't return as manager of the Angels. Does that make sense to you? Sure it does. They were disastrous this year. This is what happened to Buck Showalter. They were high-profile teams, and they were disastrous. John Morant will be allowed to practice and travel with the Grizzlies while suspended. Is that all right with you? No. So two-thirds of the things that happen, he can participate with the team? And is that a real suspension in the league's mind? Is that really? Joe Namath took back his criticism of Zach Wilson. You surprised? I'm a little surprised. I guess it's Joe being a nice guy, and Zach Wilson had an okay game the other That's day. Pretty good. I don't know. That's pretty good. You know, Joe's entitled. Remember, it's Joe. This is the highlight, Joe kids. Willie. Last Davis. one. NHL preseason hockey tonight. Red Wings at Blackhawks. I'm sure you're watching that. Game. The Red Wings just beat us like six one or six two on Sunday. Yeah. Connor Bedard is why I'm going to watch. Ninety eight. That's a sweater. Tony. A lot of Pay time. attention. And we will try to do better the next time. And I'm Tony Kornheiser. I'm Mike Wilbon. Still in a deuce tomorrow, Knuckleheads. You can get the really? podcast on the app or Apple get Podcast. Habit. James Harden, he got to go. What are you doing to him, B? Yeah. Huh? I think we should do ESPN2 effort tomorrow. Show up and shoot. This. 